Because just the notion that he would be walking somewhere thinking the Prophet ﷺ might be underneath. He said, I could not fathom that. So he really, he was, he was sort of very stressed out with this. So he approaches the Prophet ﷺ and he says, please, O Messenger of Allah, make it easy for me. I just can't live above you. I can't live on a level above you. It's just, it's not happening. It's not happening. When the Prophet ﷺ saw this, he just said, you, you take the uh, ground floor and I will go on the upper level. Uh, so this shows you the sensitivity of the, uh, and, the, and the tenderness and the beauty of the Ansar. Of the Ansar. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala praised them as these people are very hospitable, very generous. So they, they, they are more concerned with their, uh, their guest than the guest is for himself. So this is how they sensitive they are, and this is their excellence, subhanAllah. This gave them uh, the upper hand when it comes to generosity and hospitality. So the Prophet ﷺ now is settled in Medina. Uh, the Muslims are happy that the Prophet ﷺ is there, and they frequent him. They're able to see him on a daily basis, learn from him, and uh, benefit from him. You remember we spoke previously about a man when the Prophet ﷺ was in Quba. Before the Prophet moves into Medina, we said for 14 days he settled in Quba, which is called also Qaryatu Bani Amr ibn Awf. Uh, a man came to the Prophet and he said, This is something that I gave you for sadaqa, that I had kept for sadaqa, so he gave it to the Prophet. And he noticed the Prophet did not eat from that, but he passed it on to others so they could eat from it. So when he saw that, he said, This is one. The man said, this is one. Now as the Prophet ﷺ settles in Medina, this man comes again to the Prophet ﷺ. And he says to the Prophet ﷺ, I saw that you have not eaten from my sadaqah. So I have kept something I wanted to give as a gift. So this is a gift for you. It was food. So the Prophet ﷺ accepts it. He eats from it. Then he passes it on to others. So the man notices this and he says, this is number two. This is number two. Uh, up until this moment, there was no masjid in Medina. So where did the Prophet ﷺ pray? When there was no masjid, where did the Prophet ﷺ pray? Actually, the narration goes, كَانَ صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ يُصَلِّي حَيْثُ أَدْرَكَتْهُ الصَّلَىٰ The Prophet ﷺ would pray wherever he is. It was Asr time. Where is he? He's at home. He would pray at home. Or he was, let's say, Maghrib time, he was with his companions outside, uh, in the outskirts of Medina. Time, let's pray. That's it. That's how he prayed. Before building Al-Masjid Al-Nabawi. Before building Al-Masjid Al-Nabawi. The Prophet ﷺ, as he was living in the house of uh, Abu Ayyub Al-Ansari, he noticed there was a piece of land that was very close. It was deserted, it wasn't utilized, and it belonged to... Some families from Banu Najjar, again, the same clan from Al Khazraj. He, he saw this piece of land and he said, You know, he said, Let's make a trade about this uh, piece of land. Name a price. They said, No, Messenger of Allah, we're not going to take anything from you. The Prophet insisted that the price be paid. The price be paid. What was in this land? It was some old graves was a piece of it was an old extremely old ancient graveyard and lots of garbage lots of garbage people whatever like people wanted to get rid of they would dump it there so the the prophet said we're going to build the masjid here so they started clearing it in order to clear it they had to remove the graves they had to remove the gra graves now the narration in arabic and that's where many people go wrong These graves, Al Qubur, the narration goes, Fanubishet Al Qubur. Nubishet Al Qubur. The Arabs here. What do you understand straight away once you hear Nubishet Al Qubur? What do you understand? What? Really? This is how we Arabs understand it today? Yeah. Yes, yeah, a very intrusive action of disrespecting a grave and tampering with it. 
without respect. But that's not what the word nubisha really means. Nubisha al qabr or the nubisha al qubur, it means they were dug out, dug out and they were removed into another area. So, for example, we have a narration about the Battle of Uhud. Uh, during the Khilafah of Muawiyah anhu. Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan was the Khalifa of the Muslims later on, later on after the death of the Prophet وسلم, after the death of the four Khulafa uh, was Muawiyah who was the Imam and this was in the past the year 60 after Hijrah there was a lot of rain so there was a flood in Medina and some of the graves of the shuhada, of the martyrs of Uhud, got uncovered. So they were the bodies of some of the martyrs of the ba in the Battle of Uhud. And this is how much, about 60 years later. And these bodies were fresh. They were still bleeding. So they were uncovered because of the rain and the floods. So the wali or the governor of Medina, he commanded... So he commanded the same thing. Meaning that they are removed. They were carried properly. They're dug out properly. And the corpse or the bodies or the remains that were there or the bones would be taken into a proper place. So that's what was done to that piece of land. So the Prophet ﷺ ordered that it be cleared and that the old graves would be removed to a proper area. Otherwise, people would be stepping on them. And then they started building Al-Masjid Al-Nabawi. They started building the house of the Prophet ﷺ. What did they use? So they used uh, dark stones. So there was some sort of black, kind of black stones that were very common in Medina. Very common. These are basalt stones. So they used this for the wall that was facing the Qibla, the southern wall facing south towards the Qibla. They used it to build this. Then they started making their own bricks from clay. Brown bricks from clay. So they started making it. And they actually benefited in this industry from someone who from Al-Yamama. Talq ibn Habib. So there was a man called Talq ibn Habib Al-Yamani. Talq ibn Habib came from Al-Yamama. Where's Al-Yamama? It's today the eastern side of Saudi Arabia. Specifically where the capital Riyadh is. Around that area. That's Al-Yamama. So he was a Muslim. And he came from that area and he joined the Muslims in Medina. So he was very skillful in making the, the, the mud and the, and the clay and sort of creating bricks out of it. So the Prophet ﷺ used to say to the companions, The Prophet ﷺ would say to the companions, leave the, you know, the making of that clay for that person from Yamama, he's very good at it. Leave it for him. Leave it for this guy. And the Muslims started carrying the stones. And there were trees, by the way. So the trees were cut off. Palm trees. They were cut off and they were used in the building of the masjid. And uh, the Muslims were carrying the bricks and carrying the stones. Everyone among the Muslims was taking part. Even the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa so the Prophet was carrying the bricks. Some of the companions would come and say to the Prophet, you know, you know, don't bother with that. We will take care of it. The Prophet would say, you know, I need the reward just as much as you guys need it. And this is a good act of leadership. A very good act of leadership that you actually engage in the work that you expect your team to, you know, deal with. So you don't deem yourself you know, important enough or of such a high status that you do not engage in these mundane type of work and tasks. No, you actually take part in that. Wherever you can help, you can help. And it doesn't mean you waste your time, you know, engaged in all these details, but basically as a leader, you know, you engage with that to a certain extent. That encourages the people and because they see their leader being, being there. And it gives them a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of inspiration, and a lot of feeling of, okay, you know, our leader knows what we're going through. He makes us feel at home. He's part of us. He's one of us. He's not like at a higher level of authority or status. He's just like one of us. And this was one of the unique characteristics of the Prophet ﷺ. Some of the people who described the Prophet ﷺ when they saw him for the first time, they said, if you see him, you think he's just one of the group. 
he fits. He fits in within the group. He belongs. But if you pay close attention, you can see he still stands out. This unique paradox was very unique to the Prophet ﷺ. When you saw him, you thought he was just one of those guys. But still with more uh, keen observation, you would see that he actually stands out. There's something really special about him. That's a unique kind of you know, paradox in leadership. And not all leaders have this. So the Prophet ﷺ was helping out. Every Muslim, the narration goes, every Muslim was carrying one brick. So they were making the bricks. By the way, at that time, they were much bigger than what we have now. So these small bricks that we have now, they're not the same size. Their bricks were really huge, massive. Uh, so each one of the companions was carrying one brick. But Ammar ibn Yasir, Ammar ibn Yasir used to carry two. He was physically strong. And the Prophet... Uh, actually the companions were uh, this shows a beautiful side the human side of the companions sometimes we display the companions in a way that makes them it's like this imaginary character it's like they're unicorns right they're not even real but actually the companions were just human beings were just human beings so they were carrying this, the stones and the bricks and they were sort of singing singing not songs in what we know today but what the Arabs called Ar-Rajaz which is basically some rhythm using some rhythm and giving it some basic tonality uh, or basic melody so they would say Allahumma innahu la khayra illa khayru al-akhira Allahumma farham al-ansara wal-muhajira so they used to sing it just like the Bedouins not only in the Arab world in other, w in other countries other cultures as well they have this kind of basic rhythm and singing that they use for weddings, uh, when they travel, you know, uh, sometimes in their gatherings. So they used to say this, and the Prophet used to listen to that and enjoy it and repeat after them. That's the Prophet ﷺ. So Ammar ibn Yasir uh, would be carrying two bricks. The Prophet ﷺ would see that, and he would be impressed with Ammar ibn Yasir. And he says, Ya wayha Ammar, taqtuluhu al-fi'atul baghiya. He says, Wow, Ammar, he will be killed by the party that is on the wrong. So Ammar gets really like puzzled and a bit troubled. And he says, he would look at the Prophet and he would say, Allahumma inna na'udu bika min al-fitan. Oh Allah, we seek your protection from the times of fitna. From the times of fitna. So the Prophet would see Ammar carrying these bricks and walking. The Prophet would approach him. Look at as well the humanity and the human side of the Prophet. Then he would come to the shoulder of Ammar and tap on it and try to rub the dust off it. And then he would say, Ya wayha Ammar, taqtuluhu al-fi'atul baghiyah. Woe to Ammar, he will be killed by the party that's on the wrong. And obviously the Prophet ﷺ here is alluding to the battle that will take, play, that will take place later on among the companions between the army of Ali ibn Abi Talib and uh, Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan radiyallahu anhum jami'an. May Allah be pleased with all of them. Uh, where Ammar would be with the army of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And he would be killed by one of the uh, people in the army of Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan radiyallahu anhum jami'an anyway so they're building the masjid and as we said the front wall which is facing south was made mainly of these black or dark stones and then the rest of the walls they were made from, um, from uh, the bricks. They were made by mud, from mud. And in the front of the masjid, which is towards the south, they used the uh, tree trunks as poles. N no, no, that, well, well, later on, yes, it was changed. But anyway, the way they built it, that was to the south, to the south, facing to the south, very good observation. Jazakallah khair. The Qibla was still in to facing towards Bayt al at that time. But to the south, there was the black wall, and then the rest of it was made by, uh, with mud, or with the bricks. And then they used the tree trunks as poles, and, you know, the leaves of the date trees and the branches were used as a canopy on top in order to make a canopy. So when they prayed, especially Dhuhr and Asr time, and you know, that land is, is hot. 
So you needed some kind of canopy to protect people from the heat of the sun. And they made, initially there was one door, but later on as the masjid developed, it was turned into three doors. So you'll find Babu Jibril, there's one door gate of Jibril, wa Babu Rahma on the opposite side. So on towards the west, towards the east, there was Babu Jibril, the gate of Jibril. Towards the west, there was Babu Ar Rahma. And towards the north, at the back, which was the front at the beginning, uh, but uh, let's, let's say the Qibla is to Al-Kaaba. At the back, which is the northern wall, there is another door, and that's for women. Al-Babu Shamali, this is called the northern gate. The northern gate that was later on made for specifically for the, uh, for the women. Now, the Masjid of the Prophet وسلم, roughly was in length 35 meters, in width it was 30 meters. 35 30, 35 meters in length and 30 meter meters in width. That's the uh, masjid of the Prophet ﷺ. Towards the end of the masjid, the back of the masjid, which was at the time the Qibla, but later on when the Qibla was moved to al kaaba or to Mecca, it became the, uh, came to be known as Suffa. A sofa, which was the back of the masjid. What is a sofa? It's more of a canopy, just like in the front, canopy, and that was made to host those who were homeless, the Muslims that were homeless, and these are the ones who were called ahlu sofa, ahlu sofa. These are the poor Muslims who had no house, no family, and uh, they had no food. They were extremely poor, and we'll come actually to describe them in detail because they were an important segment of the Muslim community at the time. Uh, so this is where they used to sleep, and they used to spend most of their day there. And the Prophet ﷺ spent a lot of time with them. This is where they were the most learned among the Muslims. The poorer ones were the most learned among the Muslims. Inshallah, we're going to have a display today of uh, uh, a prototype of how the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ was built at the time because the Prophet ﷺ, next to the masjid, he built his own house. So he built a house for himself that was made of chambers. So you have uh, first the chamber of Hafsa, which later on would become the chamber of Hafsa. Next to it, the chamber of Aisha, عنها, and uh, a little bit further was the house or the chamber of Sauda. Also next to the masjid was the house of Ali and Fatima, which would be the house of Ali and Fatima later on, another chamber. Uh, so this is what we know to be right next to the uh, to the the, uh, the, uh, the masjid of the Prophet Yes. Uh, Abu Bakr's house, I'm not sure exactly where it was, but it not necessarily next to the house of the Prophet Inshallah we'll see in the demonstration, so I hope the brothers and the media will just get that soon. Really. So, <coughs> at the beginning, when they built the masjid, uh, people would just come to the masjid at the time of Adhan. People would sort of uh, have an assessment about, was it time for Asr, time for Dhuhr, whatever, and they would just come to the masjid and have the jama'ah and pray. So there was no call for prayer, there was no Adhan. Then, uh, the Prophet ﷺ used to give the khutbah. He started giving the Jum'ah, the Friday khutbah. And how did the Prophet ﷺ do it? He would stand next to, there was a trunk. And it wasn't full length, it was up to a certain height. The Prophet ﷺ would stand next to it, and he would sort of lean on it when he was standing. That's how the Prophet ﷺ used to give the khutbah. But one of the neighbors of the masjid, one of the women of Al-Ansar, she was a rich woman, and she sees that the Prophet ﷺ was giving the khutbah, but she saw there were more people coming now. M more Muslims, and the Jum'ah masjid was full, even overflowing with people. And uh, so she, she thought of making a podium for the Prophet ﷺ, or a pulpit, or a member, where the Prophet ﷺ could stand, elevated, and people are better able to see him, and his voice would reach further, as he's at a, at a higher altitude or level. 
so she approached the Prophet and she says, إِنَّ لِي فَتًا نَجَّارًا وَعَبْدًا نَجَّارًا أَفَلَا نَصْنَعُ لَكَ مِنْ بَرًا So she says, I have one of my slave slaves is actually a carpenter, very skillful ca carpenter. So what do you think if we create a pulpit for you, make a pulpit for you? The Prophet Sallam, he, he likes the idea. So he says, well, why not? So she orders uh, that carpenter to make the, the pulpit and he makes it. And they put it in the masjid. So it was three steps. It was made of three steps. The first two, just like similar to this, let's say, without obviously the, the decoration and the beauty and stuff. It was a very basic thing. So we'd have two steps the Prophet ﷺ would stand on. One, two. And the third one, he would sit on it before the khutbah and in the middle of the khutbah. That was the member of the Prophet ﷺ. So the first time the Prophet ﷺ is given the khutbah on this member, on this pulpit, as soon as he starts his khutbah, there is some strange noise in the masjid. And it was more like the crying and the whining of a little baby. So they turn around and the Prophet ﷺ realizes that it was that trunk, that tree trunk the Prophet ﷺ used to lean on, started crying like a baby. So the Prophet ﷺ turns to the companions and he says, أَفَلَا تَنظُرُونَ إِلَى هَذِهِ الشَّجَرَةُ إِلَى هَذِهِ الْخَشَبَةُ إِنَّهَا تَبْكِي عَلَى مَا كَانَتْ تَسْمَعُ مِنَ الذِّكْرِ He says, this trunk is crying because it misses the remembrance of Allah that it used to be connected to when I was saying it, when I was leaning on it, when I was depending on it. So the Prophet ﷺ comes down from the member. He, un he unclimbs the member and he unmounts the member and he walks to that trunk and he holds it. And then the companion who narrates the story, he says, it's exactly like when you carry a baby who was just crying. When you hold that baby, it starts sobbing and feeling a little bit quiet and calm. It was making the same noise until it became fully quiet. Then the Prophet ﷺ leaves it and he goes back to the member and he carries on. He finishes his khutbah. He finishes his khutbah. And that shows that all the creation of Allah that you see here, that was a very clear manifestation, but all the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has a life of its own and it's invisible to us Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran there is nothing except that it celebrates and glorifies Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala but you cannot or you do not comprehend their tasbih they make tasbih everything makes tasbih this table this bottle, the ceiling, the walls, the cars, the trees, the wind, the clouds, everything worships Allah. Everything praises Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The plants, everything, the animals, everything worships Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we do not comprehend that, that, that glorification. We do not understand it. But sometimes, for certain reasons, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes it visible just like this trunk at the time of the Prophet That's just like another rock that we talked about in the Meccan period when the Prophet was in Mecca. He said, Inni la hajaran bi kana yusallimu qabla al That there is a stone that I know in Mecca that used to greet me before I received the revelation. He used to give salam to the Prophet It was a, a stone, a rock. In that we call it inanimate object, right? Because our, our, the title or the name that we give it is limited to our perception. But everything has a life of its own. Everything has a life of its own. The fact that we don't see it, we don't capture it, doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It's there. So the Prophet ﷺ finishes his khutbah. Uh, it's important to know about this, the member of the Prophet ﷺ, that the Prophet ﷺ utilized it to clarify so many things about the religion of Islam. So one day the Prophet ﷺ gets on top of the member to the third level, the third step, on top of it. And he turns to Qibla and he says, Allahu Akbar. And he starts his salah. He starts his salah. <coughs> so he makes rukur. Then he, Samia Allahu liman hamda, stands up. Then he unmounts, stepping backward, unmounts the member, goes down because there's no space for him to make. Sujood. There's not enough space. So he goes down to the floor. He makes sujood. Two sajda. 
Then when he's done with his sujood, he stands up, then he walks, climbs the member again to the th third level, and he makes the second rak'ah again. Then when he reaches sujood again, he goes down, walking backwards, he goes down, and uh, he completes his two rak'ah. Then he turns to the companions, he says, لَقَدْ فَعَلْتُ ذَلِكَ حَتَّى تَرَوْ صَلَاتِي أَوْ لِتَأْتَمُّوا بِي I've done this so that you see my salah. Or so that you copy my salah. Then he says, Sallu kama ra'aytumuni usalli. You pray as you saw me pray or as you see me pray. So the Prophet ﷺ utilized the minbar. Utilized the minbar. I was going to ask you, Mustafa, to do that. <laughs> so, so actually, I'm just thinking of demonstrating it just for the sake of it. So. Pardon me, sisters. I don't think the sisters will be able to see that. Or if you can, Mustafa, turn the, the, the camera. So we're just going to do it just to show what the Prophet Sallallahu did. So I'm, I'm not going to pray. I'm just going to demonstrate. So it's not, it's not going to be a prayer. I will say the Prophet Sallallahu mounted the member. And he started his salah. And that's so this is roughly what the Prophet ﷺ did. And what do we benefit from this? Is that the Prophet ﷺ used to demonstrate to the companions. So he would use visuals, right? <laughs> use visuals. The Prophet ﷺ tried to use that in demonstration. And we know this is actually the Prophet ﷺ did that a few times. So one day with the companions, uh <coughs> The Prophet ﷺ, as Abdullah bin Mas'ud says, خط لنا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم خطا. The Prophet ﷺ made a line in the sand for us. It's a long line. Then around it, he made scattered short lines around it, on right and left. Then he says to the companions, هذا صراط الله. He says, this is the path of Allah, the long one, the straight one. وهذه سبل. Upon each of those small lines, each one of them is a path. Upon each path, there is a shaitan that is calling people to it. Then he recited, In Surah Al-An'am. And this is my straight path, so follow it. Do not follow the other paths, lest they take you away from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Prophet ﷺ used this kind of visuals in order to demonstrate to people, help them figure things out. And one day the Prophet ﷺ sees the companions. Uh, he was with the companions. It was a full moon. And the Arabs romanticize about the moon a lot. It's, it's strongly present in their culture. So, so if they want to describe some, someone as beautiful, they would say, مِثْلُ qamar, right? مِثْلُ qamar. Someone wants to describe a handsome face, they would say it's like the moon, it's like the full moon. Uh, so the Prophet sees this full moon and he says, Do you guys see the full moon? The companions, yes, we see it. He says, فَإِنَّكُمْ سَتَرَوْنَ رَبَّكُمْ عَيَانَا لَا تُضَامُونَ فِي رُؤْيَتِهِ كَمَا تَرَوْنَ هَذَا الْبَدْرِ You see the full moon? He said, yes. He says, you shall see or look at the face of your Lord as you see the moon. Nothing will hold you back from looking at it or seeing it. So the Prophet would use visuals from the environment, from the environment of the people, so they could relate to what he says. So part of it was using the minbar uh, to clarify to them the salah and how to, how to pray. The Prophet ﷺ talks about his member because his member had four uh, foundations, foundational pillars. So the Prophet ﷺ says, min bari hadha rawatibun fil jannah. These pillars of my full pillars of my member, of my pulpit, are actually pillars in paradise. Will be pillars in paradise. Not only that, the Prophet ﷺ says, Ma bayna min bari wa bayti. 
ما بين منبر روضة من رياض الجنة between my member and my house between my member and my house this is one of the gardens of paradise and that's a rawda الشريفة that when you go to Mecca or to Medina people fight to pray there and I think it's it's green the green is it green green carpet right it's green mats yeah the green mats it's marked by the green mats and they have a time for females right where males are not allowed to go there and then there are times for the general public for the brothers and usually there's a lot of tension there's a lot of fighting in order to pray there unfortunately a place that is supposed to be for peace and for tranquility it's been abused so you'll find someone who's been there for hours and they're not willing to leave where are the, where, whereas there are people lining up waiting and waiting for hours and people are not leaving to allow the others there now I don't know how what are you going to get from that you co you commit I would say some some sort of a inappropriate act to your Muslim brothers and sisters that's far greater that's far greater if you are kind to them you're going to get much more reward than just praying in that spot but you go you sacrifice the greater for the lesser that's called and sorry for that term I, I use it with reservation dumb religiosity you can't be dumb about your religiosity you you you, you, you for example you commit a huge sin in order to make uh, a small sunnah like and an something that you can you, that you don't have to do it's optional for you to do any updates with the with the laptop oh we're still there but 10 minutes I'm not gonna grill you in public <laughs> so let me know when you're ready yeah? right so <coughs> Anyway, so that's al-rawda, al-rawda sharif Also, the Prophet ﷺ talks about, about merits and rewards for al-masjid al-nabawi. So the Prophet ﷺ says, Salatun fi masjidi afdalu min alfi salatin fi ma siwah. So a prayer, a prayer in my uh, masjid is better than a thousand prayers in any other masjid. It counts as a thousand prayers, as a thousand prayers. So it counts as a thousand prayers in any other masjid. So you get the, the, the reward of a thousand prayers when you pray in the uh, masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam illa al-masjid al-haram except for the masjid al-haram in Mecca وَصَلَاتٌ فِي الْمَسْجِدِ الْحَرَامِ أَفْضَلُ مِنْ مِئَةِ أَلْفِ صَلَاتٍ فِي مَا سِوَاهِ Whereas if you pray in the haram in Mecca it's better in reward than a hundred thousand prayers. Than a hundred thousand prayers. So you pray al-dhuhr you pray dhuhr in al-masjid al-haram in Mecca, it is as, it's better than you praying dhuhr a hundred thousand times. So this is why when you go for Umrah or Hajj, you know, don't miss out on praying in the haram. Don't miss out. And yes, some scholars say any masjid you pray within Mecca, within the haram area, it counts as this, but that's a doubtful matter. <laughs> don't compromise. Go to the haram itself and pray. And when it's full, as long as it, the lines are extended are, and connected, even if you pray in the streets because of the, it's just jammed, then as long as the lines are connected, you get the reward. And even when the masjid expands, the reward, expa the reward extends with it. So it's not like, oh, it's, this is only with the borders at the time of the Prophet ﷺ. No. As long as the masjid expands, then the reward follows with the new uh, lines or the new uh, area of the masjid that is added to the masjid. So <coughs> let's look at the this. This is, by the way, there is the uh, Medina exhibition, and it's such a profound and beautiful exhibition in Medina. So if you happen to go for Umrah or Hajj, uh, make a point to go and visit it. So they have actually a prototype of the masjid of the Prophet ﷺ, the houses of Medina itself, of Al Khandaq, the trench of even some the clothing at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu the weapons, the swords, the spears, everything. They tried to create an exhibition of everything that relates to their life. Uh, so anyway, we don't need to play the video. This is a very good uh, outlook on it. So for us, <coughs> do you see the, the size? Is it? It's not exactly the same, but anyway. This side, which you see the canopy here on this side, Okay, it's supposed to be completely covered, but this is just for the sake of demonstration to show you what how it was built. This is towards the Qibla. 
Okay, this side, this is the side of the Qibla. This is the side of the, of the Qibla. This is the masjid. So we said in length, oh, that's playing. All right, stop it. So in length, this is basically uh, 35 meters and the width is 30 meters, roughly speaking, roughly speaking. Uh, and these chambers to the side of the masjid are the houses of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ, along with the house of Fatima and Ali. So right in the front, which is the far end, I'm not sure the pointer is always is also here. Okay, let me see. It's this, yeah, this house around here. This is the house of Hafsa. That, that would be later on, okay, because the Prophet ﷺ would marry Hafsa later on after the Battle of Uhud. And next to it, number two, is the house of Aisha or the chamber of Aisha. Then right next to it is that of Fatima, the house of Fatima. So I don't know where the pointer is. That's it. Number three here is the Fatim, Fatima, the house of Fatima and Ali later on. This is where they live. Then the one that's after, and that's Ummu Salama, the chamber of Ummu Salama here. And uh, Let's go to the second row, which has two chambers. The first one towards the Qibla, it's, let me see where the pointer is, yeah. Here, this is the house of Sauda, bintu Zam'a, radiyallahu anha, the wife of the Prophet sallam. And next to it is the chamber of Zainab, bintu Jahsh, radiyallahu anha, also the wife of the Prophet sallam. Now there is, as far as historians are concerned, they don't know where the rest of the houses of the wives of the Prophet sallam were exactly they were. We don't know exactly where they are, so they didn't put them in that prototype. They did not share them in this exhibition. So looking at also at the, uh, at the doors. So you will find right next to the chambers of the Prophet ﷺ, this is the, where's the pointer? Oh man. Anyway, you will find the, right next to the chambers of the Prophet ﷺ, there was Babu Jibril, the door of Jibril, the door of Jibril. On the opposite side, there is Babu Rahma, on the far end here, on the far end. And to the back, to the back of the masjid, not where the big canopy is, where the smaller canopy is, that's Al Babu Shamali, the northern gates. So there were three doors or gates into the masjid of the Prophet. Uh, where was the pulpit or the member of the Prophet ﷺ placed later on after the Qibla was changed towards Ma Mecca, towards Al Kaaba? It's pretty much towards the corner where it's still covered now. You see where it's covered now? The canopy? In that corner, this is where the pulpit or the member of the Prophet ﷺ was. And today, until today, they have a small member. They have a small member. Or they actually have the member there. It's still in the same spot where the member of the Prophet ﷺ was. So when you go to the Haram in Medina, you're going to find that the pulpit there or the member, and that's where the Khatib gives the khutbah. I think that's where the Khatib gives the khutbah. I'm not actually. I think that's, but you will find the member there. You will find the member there, but it's not the member of the Prophet. Salam. It's been rebuilt because this is a huge member that they put there now. Uh, towards the back, which is the thinner canopy, towards the back where the northern gate is or Bab al-Shamali is, that's where Ahl Sufa used to stay, the homeless among the Muslims. That's where they used to sleep and live, and that's where the learning used to take place. Reciting Quran and learning Quran and teaching Quran and everything, and the Prophet ﷺ used to spend time with them. It used to be done around that place. So again, towards the south, where the uh, Yeah, where the, the, the Kaaba is, where the, the bigger canopy is, we said that wall was made mainly of the black stones of Medina. The black stones of Medina. The rest of the uh, circle of the masjid was built with bricks that were, ma that were made of mud. Is that clear? It's good to see this kind of prototype. It does help visualizing Sorry, what it was like. But you see, most of the masjid is, is uncovered. Most of the masjid is not covered. Because they had limited resources, that was the only thing available to them, and uh, sort of uh, 
So imagine how it was during Jum'ah in the heat of the sun. But alhamdulillah, that was what the Muslims were capable of. And for the first few years in Medina, the Muslims were not, by the way, rich. They were really struggling financially. People were struggling even to find food to eat. Struggling to find food to eat for about six, seven years in Medina, it was extremely difficult. Extremely difficult, yes. Good question. Where would the women pray in the masjid? Uh, during the salah, the area where a suffa is, you know, where the poorer people at the back would stay, that's where the women prayed. And something important to observe about the women at the time, that and this is how it should be, men, the Prophet ﷺ said, خَيْرُ صُفُوفِ الرِّجَالِ أَوَّلُهَا the best of the lines of the prayer of men is the first one, then the second one, then the third one. And the best of the lines of the women is the last. So how do women start praying? How do they line up for prayer? We line up, we fill up first the first line, right? Women are supposed to fill up the last line first. Then the line that's in front of it. Then the line that's in front of it. This is how women are supposed to pray. And uh, the sunnah is for women to be able to see what the men are doing. That's the right way. That's the right way. So the Prophet ﷺ did not create a, uh, a separate musalla for the women. No, but he put the women in the back. So they could see. So the first line of men could see what the Prophet ﷺ was doing so they could follow him. Second line would see what the first line is doing. So they would follow him and so on and so forth. And the women would see what the men were doing and they would follow. And that would eliminate a lot of confusion when the Imam makes a mistake or he makes sujood tilawa, right? He's recited the Quran and there is a sajda and he goes for sujood and then the, the sisters or the women they go for ruku'ah. They don't realize. So the Imam says, Sami Allahu liman hamida and they're confused. Oh, sorry, the Imam says, Allahu Akbar. They expect him to say, Sami Allahu liman hamida, right? There's a confusion and they don't know what to do. And until they figure it out, they've already missed a rak'ah with the Imam. <laughs> so it's the sunnah for the women to be in the back so they can observe and they can see what is happening. But the Prophet ﷺ was commanding women to be well dressed. And the Prophet ﷺ would. Uh, for example, there is an, there's an etiquette about Salat al-Jama'ah. No one should move, should leave their spot after Salat. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. The people who are praying behind the Imam, they should keep, maintain their spots until the Imam turns around. That's an etiquette that's not observed. People should not move, ideally, ideally, should not leave their spot or start moving until the Imam turns away from the Qibla. Hatta yansarif al Imam. It's called insiraf. So the Imam turns to the side or he turns backwards towards the people who pray behind him. So people should not leave their spot until the Imam turns, even if it's slightly. And why, some of the scholars say, why would the Prophet ﷺ stay for a while facing the Qibla, not turning around, to give time for the women to leave before the men can start leaving and turning around? Because the Prophet ﷺ wanted to give women that space. He wanted to give the women that space. Then later on, the Prophet ﷺ, when he saw that men and women were coming into the masjid through the same door, he says, لَوْ جَعَلْنَا لِلنِّسَاءِ بَابًا He said, I wish we could make a separate gate, a separate house for the women. So they don't have to mix with the men and jam around the door as they entering or leaving. So this is why later on Al-Bab al-Shamali, the northern gate, which is towards the back, was actually dedicated for the women later on. So they enter through that door. Uh, so this is where the women used to, this is where the women used to pray. Uh, also we know that Al-Masjid al-Nabawi is just like one of the three masajid Al-Masjid Al-Haram, Al-Masjid Al-Nabawi, and Al-Masjid Al-Aqsa that are the only masajid in Islam that it is permissible for you to travel to go and pray in them. In Islam, it's impermissible for you to, to travel specifically to pray in a masjid. To pray specifically in a masjid. Except these three masajid. لا تشد الرحال إلا إلى ثلاثة مساجد. 
the Prophet says, it's impermissible to travel, to pray in a masjid, except for the three masajid. Al-Masjid al-Haram, wa masjidi hada, wa masjid al-Aqsa. Masjid al-Haram in Mecca, Masjid al-Nabawi, Masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa Masjid al-Aqsa in Al-Quds. That's it. But you travel to another shrine, you travel to another, for example, uh, <laughs> like you travel to pray in, uh, let's say, Masjid al-Sheikh Zayed in Abu Dhabi, right? It's such a beautiful construction, right? I'm going to travel to United Arab Emirates to pray in that masjid. I say, haram. <laughs> haram, you can't travel to pray there. But if you're traveling there already, okay, and you decide to visit the masjid and see it, pray in it, oh, no worries. But don't travel specifically to pray in that masjid. I want to show you another, um, actually, view. I'm not sure if I can get to the other video. <coughs> Bismillah. Yeah, this shows you this is another view. This is another view of how it looks like. This is from the northern side. See, this is from the northern side. This is Al Bab al Shamali, the northern gate, which is number 12. You see a number 12 there. And then the Sufa, and then you have then the area where they used to pray where the Prophet ﷺ used to lead, and where the member is, is on the corner that is still covered now. Still covered now. Then you have the chambers. So obviously the chambers, or the houses of the Prophet ﷺ, were not built at once. Were not built at once. According to need, when there was a need, when the Prophet ﷺ had a new wife, she had no chamber, they would build a chamber there, or a house there. So that's the view of, uh, a view into the, uh, the Masjid of the Prophet ﷺ and his house. That's it. Okay. So we'll move on. Inshallah, in, in the future as we move on, every time we talk about uh, some of the events that take place, some of the battles, Inshallah, we're going to try to find good uh, pictures or good videos where can it can give us some kind of a demonstration in order to help us visualize that uh, these things. So... <coughs> So at this moment, the wives of the Prophet ﷺ had not arrived yet. And this mo up until this moment, the wives of the Prophet ﷺ had not arrived yet in Medina. But who was on the way? There was Aisha on the way, but she she's been she's engaged to the Prophet ﷺ, but he had not married her yet. He had not consummated the marriage. So she was on the way around that time. She was on the way to Medina. And with her was her sister Asma bint Abi Bakr. So they were on the way. Asma bint Abu Bakr, she says, I set out from Mecca. We left Mecca. And she, she, was in her, she was in pregnancy. She, was in her, she already entered the ninth month, the last month of pregnancy. Nevertheless, she set out. And you know, traveling there, it was not those you know luxury uh, buses or coaches or uh, trains it was you had to ride a camel you had to walk it was difficult uh, three to six days journey it was extremely difficult she was pregnant but she was yet yeah, nevertheless she made the journey to medina now as soon as they arrive in quba which is to the south of medina as soon as they arrive in quba she cannot carry on anymore. And then she goes through labor. She goes through labor and she gives birth. She gives birth. Who's the husband of Asma? Az Zubair ibn Awam. So she, who's the boy? Abdullah ibn Az Zubair. Abdullah ibn Az Zubair. And this is the first Muslim to be born in Medina. The first child to be born into a Muslim family in Medina. Abdullah. Ibn Zubair. When he was born, they take him to Medina to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi holds him, gets hold of him, and what does he do? The Prophet sallallahu takes a date. He chews on it until it melts in his mouth, and when he does, he spits his saliva that is mixed with the dates in the mouth of the baby. 
in the mouth of the baby. So Asma' says, فَكَانَ أَوَّلُ شَيْءٍ دَخَلَ فِيهِ رِيقُ رَسُولِ اللَّهِ صلى الله عليه وسلم. The first thing that enters the mouth of uh, my son, it was the saliva of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. That's Abdullah ibn Zubair رضي الله عنه. Don't do this. <laughs> Don't do this. The correct opinion, this is specific to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because you have a lot of bacteria, especially if you have rotten teeth <laughs> or infected uh, gum or issues, man, don't do that. <laughs> you might just, uh, I don't know, the baby end up in the uh, intensive care unit <laughs> or something. <laughs> so be careful. Child abuse. You might get in trouble, right? They might take you to jail. <laughs> so be careful. But what you can do, what you can do, and uh, most hospitals and doctors accommodate this and respect it. If you say this is a religious practice for us and tradition, they actually respect it if you do it in a hygienic way. So what you can do is peel off a date because the skin of a date is very sticky and it's dangerous for a little baby. So make sure you peel it with a knife properly and just take the flesh of a date and put it in uh, purified boiled water. Let it cool down, boil it, then let it cool down and you make sure it's, it's, uh, it's hygiene and clear. And then uh, let the date melt in it. You can wear uh, gloves, uh, the ones that they use in the hospital. Uh, and then you melt it there and once you get this thick syrup, date syrup, you rub it against the gum of the little boy. So that's a sunnah to do. That's before the baby takes anything. That's the first thing. That's the, the Prophet ﷺ did that with other children. They used to be brought to the Prophet ﷺ as soon as they were born. And the Prophet ﷺ would chew on the date and take from the saliva and rub it against the gum of the little boy. And one day he was doing this to the brother of Anas, Ibn Malik, the little boy. And the boy starts sucking on the finger of the Prophet ﷺ and he likes the dates. Actually, Children, li subhanAllah, the little baby, they like it. They seem to like it. So the Prophet says, Unduru ila hubbil ansar al -tamr. He says, look at how the ansar love the dates. It's like in their blood, the love of the dates. So this is a sunnah. So the Prophet ﷺ did that with Abdullah ibn Zubair. Uh, <coughs> Aisha radiallahu anha, she says, as soon as I arrived in Medina, I was hit by an illness. What are the symptoms of this illness? Her hair was falling off <laughs> profusely. Like she almost lost her hair completely. It was falling off. Then, uh, then she makes dua uh, until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings back her hair. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings back her hair. And the Prophet ﷺ then would soon uh, marry Aisha radiallahu and it was such a beautiful day for the people of Medina. It was such a beautiful day of celebration. And not only the Prophet ﷺ got married, uh, Hamza, the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, also gets married. But he marries from the Ansar. So there is a man called Qais ibn Fahd. Hamza radiallahu anhu strikes a very good friendship with him. And he marries his daughter Khawla. Khawla bint Qais. She becomes the wife of Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib. And Hamza ibn Abdul Muttalib seems to have to have developed a very beautiful relationship with his in-laws. So he would spend a lot of time with his father-in-law, who was his friend as well. And the Prophet ﷺ would also spend time with them and visit them. To the point that Khawla bin Qais, the wife of Hamza, she actually narrated a lot of hadith from the Prophet ﷺ. She narrated a lot of hadith from the Prophet ﷺ. So one of the hadith that she narrated was when the Prophet ﷺ says, she says basically, Inna Rasulullah dakhala ala Hamza dunya. The Prophet came to visit Hamza. So they mentioned the dunya, they mentioned this life. Faqala Rasulullah dunya khadiratun hulwa. The Prophet says, This life is green and beautiful and sweet. Faman akhadaha bihaqiha burika lahu fiha. So whoever, whoever takes it with its right, with its due right. Basically, he takes it from halal. And he takes it to utilize it. He's not obsessed with it. 
then Allah would bless it for him. So whatever you take from this dunya, you take it from halal and you take it for a good reason, not being, you know, desperate to get it and, and greedy, then Allah would bless that possession for you, bless that wealth for you. وَرُبَّ مُتَخَوِّضٍ فِي مَالِ اللَّهِ وَمَالِ رَسُولِهِ لَهُ النَّارِ يَوْمَ يَلْقَ اللَّهِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامِ And how many people would actually abuse the money that Allah has given them and then that would be a source of torture for them on the day of judgment. They would be burnt in the fire because of that. So the Prophet ﷺ would generally, you know, he had a rich social life. The Prophet ﷺ would ha had a rich social life. And... Although this was such a beautiful time in Medina, there were some sad moments. Some sad moments. Any one of you remembers Sa'd ibn Zurara? Sa'd ibn Zurara from the Ansar? He was the host, the host of, of Mus'ab ibn Umair. Remember when the Prophet was still in Medina? Some of the people of Medina came and they said, O Messenger of Allah, send, someone, send one of your companions to teach us. He sent Mus'ab ibn Umair, who was the host of Mus'ab ibn Umair, As'ad ibn Zurara. He was the one providing protection for Mus'ab ibn Umair. He was one of the early Muslims there. Ka'b ibn Malik, one of the Ansar, famous one, who, who was one of, one, one of the three who were left behind in the Battle of Tabuk. Okay? He's the one when he met the Prophet ﷺ in Mecca previously. He found the Prophet ﷺ sitting with Al-Abbas in the shade of the Kaaba. He comes to the Prophet ﷺ with As'ad ibn Zurara, right? And they know Al-Abbas. So uh, Al-Abbas, the uncle of the Prophet ﷺ, he says, do you know these people? The Prophet ﷺ says, no. Prophet, uh, so Al-Abbas says, this is Ka'b ibn Malik. The Prophet ﷺ says, a sha'ir, the poet? That's the poet? The Prophet ﷺ already knew about him. So Ka'b ibn Malik says, I felt so like cherished and appreciated by the Prophet ﷺ that he recognized me. So As'ad ibn Zurara, the host of Mus'ab ibn Umayr, this great companion, one of the early Muslims in Medina, he, he falls ill and then he passes away. So Ka'b bin Malik, he has a special story. He says, every time I hear the Adhan, every time I hear the Adhan or the, I see the Salah, congregational Salah, I seek forgiveness for As'ad ibn Zurara. Why? He says, لِأَنَّهُ كَانَ أَوَّلَ مَنْ جَمَّعَ بِنَا فِي الْمَدِينَةِ When the Mus there was started to be some Muslim individuals in Medina, the first one to establish the jama'ah for the Muslims in Medina was As'ad ibn Zurara. So every time there was a jama'ah, Ka'b ibn Malik remembers him, he makes dua for him. So the Prophet ﷺ prays on, uh, on As'ad ibn Zurara, and uh, here we can connect a story. We can connect a story because... Let's say this was the burial of As'ad ibn Zurara and the Prophet ﷺ was sitting around next to the grave. And the Prophet ﷺ, when he sat next to the grave after the, uh, the burial, he would say, استغفروا لأخيكم فإنه الآن يسأل Seek forgiveness for your brother because now he's being questioned. Now he's being asked. Three questions, right? من ربك ما دينك ما تقول في هذا الرجل الذي بعث فيكم Who's your Lord? Who's your Ilah? The one that you used to worship? What's your deen? What was your way of life? What was your religion? And what do you say about the man that was sent to you as a messenger? These are three questions. The person will be questioned. So the Prophet says, seek forgiveness for him. Hopefully Allah would support him to answer these questions. Around this time, someone comes. Comes around. And he starts sneaking behind the Prophet wasallam. He's very curious. It's obvious that he's, he's looking for something. He's trying to see something at the back of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet Sallallahu notices him. Then the Prophet Sallallahu does something strange he doesn't usually do. So what does the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam do? We find out next week, inshallah. <laughs> so we'll stop here, inshallah. <laughs> and we'll carry on, inshallah, next week. So we can have a few questions before we go. Do we have any questions here on the floor? Yeah. Yeah. 
no, the <coughs> I don't want to get into the details of this because it, so for some people it might require further explanation. But generally speaking, the army of Muawiyah and the army of uh, Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhum jamia, uh, the uh, who had more rights uh, was the army of, of Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhum. Was Ali ibn That's the majority of the scholars of Ahl Sunnah. Some of the scholars they have a bit more nuanced answer. They would say the ones that were upon the most truth, they were the ones who were not involved in that com at all. Like Abdullah ibn Umar, like Abu Hurairah. They said, no, we don't get involved in, the in this whole thing. That's the most correct opinion, the strongest stance. But among these two groups, the army of Ali ibn Abi Talib and the army of Muawiyah, who, was, who had more truth with them. This is why so those scholars who, who had this more nuanced approach, they said basically both sides had some truth and some mistakes. But the truth was leaning more towards the uh, side of the Muawiyah, the group of Muawiyah, of, oh sorry, Ali ibn Abi Talib. And they use this hadith as a clear, this hadith is authentic. They use it as a clear indication Ammar will be killed by the basically al baghiya here is not even on the wrong but it's basically the more oppressor the more oppressor so basically they were on, on the wrong compared to the group of Ali ibn Abi Talib suffice it to say that otherwise it could get a bit more complicated so any questions here? yeah Ahlul Sufa yes Jazakallah khair. I think this is this clarification is needed. Because when I said homeless, it's not necessarily like the homeless that we have here today. What I'm saying is, these are people who could not afford a home or a house. A lot of them were strangers, actually. Like one of Ahlul Sufa was Abu Huraira. <laughs> he was from Ahlul Sufa. Abu Huraira, at the beginning, he had no house. And the reason these people were poor is that they dedicated their life for the study of Islam and to learn the Quran. So that's why they were homeless. Not that they chose to, like, uh, they had nothing to do or they were idle and they, they were not motivated to do something, no. But it's, these are people who decided to dedicate their life for the learning of the Qur'an, the study of the Qur'an. And because of that, they, they, were, they had no jobs, they had no business, and they had no finances. So Jazakallah khair, yes, the clarification is needed. There's one announcement I, I want to make about the summer jobs is the applications are posted online on the website abuhuraira.org and volunteers are welcome and needed for Ramadan, please. Okay, uh, for Ramadan, inshallah, we will need some volunteers. So this is an opportunity for everyone to actually start from now. We don't want to leave it last minute. So if any of the younger brothers, even the older ones, want to help out with whatever work is required during Ramadan, this is an opportunity as well to get some reward because whatever you help with, feeding the fasting people and making it comfortable for them, inshallah, helping them out, you will get uh, some of the rewards. So please email, if you're interested, info at abuhuraira.org or see the brothers in the main office, specifically Brother Awale. So <coughs> I'm getting written questions and I'm not good with reading, so it takes me time. So please, I mean, if you can stay until we get these questions out. There are two questions so I'm going to take. I assume they are from the sisters. So we need to give them a fair chance as well. Okay, basically a father chose uh, a husband, I assume it's, it's a boy, but I assume it's a husband for his daughter. And he inquired about that boy or that man, that husband, uh, ca can that candidate, and uh, he found it to be a good match. He was satisfied, then they got married. The daughter and that young man got married. But then the daughter finds out that this young man that she married uh, had told a lot of lies about himself to the father. So about his education, about his profession, 
so the marriage, a lot of the acceptance was actually based on his reputation, which was, was mainly lies. That's what the question says. Now the, now the daughter blames the father and she's suffering in this marriage. Is this father to blame in the eye of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Now Allah holds people to account. It's not for me to say Allah. I don't know the details. Every story has two sides or actually more. So it's not for me really to judge. If a father has, in, uh, has inquired to the best of his ability, which he should, and she should, he should exhaust all efforts to find out about the person, definitely, because that's the life of his daughter. Uh, but I do want to say I sense a bitterness here. So this is why I'm hesitant to say anything specific about this case. But in general, I would answer, in general, it's the responsibility of the father or the wali to really inquire and find out and dig out anything about a candidate and he should do his best. Obviously people go through circumstances, go through conditions, they go through some troubled times, so how will he do that? That's between him and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But regardless, whether he's blameworthy or not blameworthy now, after the, all of this has happened, that's with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not going to change the situation. Now, what really matters is how this daughter is going to live with her husband. And I think she should figure a way to really make this work out. If the husband has potential to be good, and so on and so forth. So that's, I think that's what matters now. So you are in a situation, start, start from now. Don't, because blame could really distract you from making the situation better. Now, who blames? Allah is going to hold people to account. You feel bad about it, you feel bitter about it, okay, that's probably the case. But let's not confuse this with how what you need to weigh up your options, whatever you can do, what, what would be the best course of action from now on to make this work out. Because now you are in a marriage, what do you want to do? Can you make it work out? Is the person, does that person have enough goodness in them that you can start building on? Hopefully he would get a, become a better person, this marriage would... Probably, you know, something could get something good could come out of it. It's uh, now this is something you want to look into. Now, if there was so many lies that makes your life really impossible with him, you definitely need to speak to an imam who's a marriage officer as well. So don't speak to me. I'm not a marriage officer. Go on and approach an imam who's a marriage officer who is who's licensed by the city, okay? And from their experience. They would actually be able to assess the situation and give you a good advice. That's in general. So you said the Prophet used to blend in with unique paradox that he simultaneously stood out and he fit in. Yes. How did he stand out? Can you elaborate? Well, okay, that's about the leadership style of the Prophet ﷺ. We said he, there was this paradox, the Prophet ﷺ, you would just feel he was, was one of the people, but also he would sta stand out. He would stand out by his mere presence. You could tell there was something, as, as you start mixing with this group of people, we can s see this person had special presence. Number two, you could see respect in the eyes of everyone else. You could see the attention gravitating towards him. The people would take the instructions from him the admiration, the, the, the respect that they would give to him. So it would show in so many ways. The wisdom that he shares, right? His unique behavior, his selflessness, his service. So it would show in so many ways. This is how it would show. So, so it's just a matter of perception. As I said, this is why I said it's a very unique paradox. How does this play out? It's, it's quite unique and you have to see it. By the way, something with leadership, and this is many experts in leadership actually say, uh, they say leadership is like an art. You, you recognize it when you see it. This is why there's a lot of definitions. Like one of the uh, meta-analysis on leadership, like there, were, there was, were scholars or researchers who tried to study leadership. And uh, there was one guy called Stockdale, one of the famous researchers on leadership. He studied all the literature on leadership in the 70s. He made a, a research about all, all research, all writings on leadership that were written in the Western world. And then he arrived at a conclusion. He says, we have as many definitions of leadership as many people who have written on leadership. So each one who wrote in leadership had their own definition. Why? It's such a profound phenomenon 
and it's hard to capture it in words. So uh, again, the leadership of the Prophet is beyond words. So, so this is, these are just glimpses we're having into the example of the Prophet or the leadership of the Prophet I can take one question from the brother's side. So if there is anyone, I would give him a chance, right? Okay, go ahead. Okay, you 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 having a journey, or you're touring a country, or you're stopping over in uh, Istanbul, and you decide to visit the Blue Mosque. If you're doing that out of tourism, yes. But if you're just doing that because I want to pray to Raqqa, are they going to be special there? That's that's what's wrong. But if you're touring it, you want to see the beauty, the architecture, etc. As a tourist, fine. And you happen to be there, it's a masjid. You say, I want to pray to Raqqa. Why? I'm going to pray in the masjid. But believing there's no special merit for these two Raqqas, nothing wrong with that, inshallah. طيب جزاكم الله خير ويميت نكست ويك إن شاء الله بحلقة زون بارك الله فيكم وصلى الله وسلم سيدنا محمد وعليه وصحبه وسلم